So let's let's just start to propose uh, some answers that might better meet the evidence. So on the tenants article, I saw a couple of things. I started with the impact zones of the towers because I thought that was interesting that a company called Martian McLennan occupied all of the floors in the North Tower where the plane impacted and the fires kind of raged there. Um, Martian McLennan was this big uh, insurance broker, financial company. And those floors that Marsh occupied were the exact floors that had been updated for fireproofing in the few years before 2011. Um, so 110 stories, and there was only eight of them that got full floor fireproofing upgrades, and all eight of them were Marsh and McLennan, floors 93 to 101, where the plane impacted. So I thought that was pretty odd. Started looking at Marsh. I thought, you know, it seemed that, that seemed odd to me. And started looking at Marsh and some of the people that work for them, and I noticed there were a couple of Bush family members, like Craig Stapleton, who uh, is, the cous- is the husband of uh, George W. Bush's cousin. Um, and uh, he was there, and he used to be uh, Bush's um, partner in the uh, Texas Rangers deal that made him so much money. I also noticed L. Paul Brimmer. This guy stood out just glaringly. L. Paul Brimmer was, the uh, two years later, the Iraq occupation governor, so people may remember him better for that. But on 9-11, he was the, the CEO of Marsh Crisis, a division of Marsh and McLennan, and he had an office in the South Tower. So when I started looking at these floors in, in the different areas of the towers, I noticed that these matched up, and Marsh had not only the entire impact zone of of uh, the North Tower, but they had a subsidiary right in the middle of the South Tower, and L. Paul Bremer had an office there. And, um, Bremer uh, was one of the first people to start giving us the official story for what happened. He somehow survived the day. I don't know how. Uh, he had a, uh, his office there, but instead of going to his office, he had showed up on all the news stations telling us that Osama bin Laden was responsible and probably Iraq and Iran also, and that we really ought to start a massive war against those people. Uh, so that's interesting. The other thing that int- was interesting about Bremer was he was a director for a Japanese company called Komatsu that had just patented a thermite demolition device in 1996. So in published, the, you know, the patent. So that I thought was interesting enough that maybe it should be investigated. Over in the South Tower impact zone, there's a couple of companies that occupied that. One of them was called Aon. And again, that, uh, uh, Bush's first cousin, Jim Pierce, worked right there. In the South Tower Impact Zone, he had a meeting. He had a meeting schedule for that day. Then he moved across the street to the Millennium Hotel, and so he survived the day, miraculously. Um, there's also Baseline Financial right there in the Impact Zone. This guy named Joseph Casputis was really interesting to me because he was very closely related to the Department of Energy, and uh, also just above him was a company called the Washington Group, and uh, they were also very closely related to the Department of Energy and had just purchased a company called Morrison Newton that. Uh, did hundreds of demolition projects for the Army Corps of Engineers. So there are a lot of people in these buildings, tenants in these buildings, that had connections to demolition technology, they had connections to the Department of Energy, they had a lot of connections to uh, the Bush family for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, so that's just, that one article stands on its own. And then I went to the security uh, design companies and, and, and contractors and found Kroll. A lot of people know about Kroll. It's this massive security company that also used to be called the CIA of Wall Street. And uh, for their investigative work. And Kroll designed the security systems for the World Trade Center complex after the 1993 bombing. And the uh, design was implemented by a couple of companies, one of them being this company called Stratisec, that uh, people often talk about this work walker and his being a relative of the Bush family. He's kind of a distant, he's just a distant relative, but he's a very interesting person. He appears to be uh, connected to the CIA, not only through his father, who worked for the CIA and the DIA, but through other circumstantial pieces of evidence. But Stratisex uh, Walker, he, uh, he hired a bunch of people from the Carlisle Group, a subsidiary of the Carlisle Group. So his chief operating officer, just he took him uh, from BDM International, which is the Carlisle Group subsidiary. And uh, BDM had a history in black projects. So Stratisex is very interesting for all these connections to not only Walker, but Marvin Bush, who was the, the president's brother, was a director at Stratisex. And, uh, and they hired all these Carlisle Group people, including uh, McDaniel. And they implemented the overall security plan right up to the day the buildings fell down. So I thought that was interesting. I and, agree. Uh, totally, yeah. totally amazing. <laughs> it seems worth investigating, uh, Todd. I think that's that's the main thing. I'm not. I mean, if we have to, we'll go forward and we'll do all the footwork and we'll, you know, make it as painfully obvious as possible that there are a lot of people like these these people I'm naming, who are at least as suspicious as the the 19 hijackers that were, <laughs> you know, at least, oh. uh, if not more, far more so. And they did benefit, and they did have technology, uh, access to the technology, and they did have access to the buildings, which, you know, when, when you know explosives were placed in the buildings, those are the questions you want answered. Um, 
You, you know, um, Kevin, I want to get to um, to the cleanup side of it too. That's important. You found some really interesting uh, stuff related to the cleanup and people involved in the cleanup. But before we go there, I'd like to talk about Rudy Giuliani for a minute or two. Um, you you told me some stuff about Rudy Giuliani that I had never known. Um, for one thing, you you seem to provide a little bit more detail about his movements on the day, um, and um, you know, good detail about the. Um, the Office of Emergency Management, OEM personnel, um, when they vacated, where they were. Um, there were um, um, interesting stuff. But uh, you mentioned that Rudy, Rudy Giuliani's um, father was a convicted um, holdup uh, criminal who had spent time in Sing Sing and had been associated with the mob in New York, and that right. his uncle was a, a mobster, and um, right. other people right. in his family were, were connected to the mafia. Um, and so um, why has Rudy Giuliani... Um, never been, uh, you know, how did he ever get elected to the mayor mayor of New York with these kind of connections? Um, uh, how come, you know, um, he was portrayed as a hero? I realize maybe this is a little bit off topic here, but I was so shocked by this stuff about Rudy Giuliani. He's portrayed as the 9-11 hero, and yet he has all of these amazingly questionable connections. And, of course, he's not the only one with, with these kind of connections. And um, when you do talk about the cleanup, you talk about a lot of mafia connections. Could you just um, talk a little bit about Rudy Giuliani? Yeah, sure. The the uh, history of Harold Giuliani, who's his father, is is I think commonly known. This wasn't something that I surprised anybody with. Harry, Harold Giuliani was this kind of uh, um, two bit thug that uh, got put away in Sing Sing for a period of time, and um, and then on Giuliani's mother's side, uh, her brother and and uh, Giuliani's cousin were both. Uh, uh, there's a good deal of evidence they're associated with the with the mob, and but you know why was Giuliani then? Um, elected as as mayor is, you know, first of all, you you can't uh, blame the sins of the father on the son. That's an old saying, and and you can't blame well, the sins I of the, he has a nephew and the cousin. And uh, it's just a lot of <laughs> circumstantial evidence, though. For this guy, it's a lot of circ circumstantial evidence that he does appear to come directly from the mob. Uh, Giuliani uh, has a long history with the Department of Justice, though. He worked at the Department of Justice for years. He was he worked at the um, Southern District Southern District of New York as well. He um, What's really interesting to me about Giuliani is that he worked for the law firms, White and Case, for example. White and Case is a famous old law firm that represented um, BCCI. Do you know the, the company, the Bank of uh, Credit Commerce International, that was yes. uh, said to be the largest bank fraud in history? It wasn't really a bank fraud. It was it was a, a CIA, a uh, world intelligence sort of uh, black ops op outfit that financed terrorists and so forth. And, and so... Giuliani, as well as a lot of other characters that were right there in New York City involved in the events, were also involved in investigating BCCI. I mean, Michael Tchaikovsky, for example, was. He was, the, at the time, the, the chairman of Kroll at the time of 9-11, but he had been previously a, a assistant DA and investigated BCCI and, and a lot of other people. So that's what interests me about Giuliani. I get the impression from Giuliani's interview with Peter Jennings on the day of 9-11 that when he went ahead and said, you know, we were told the buildings were going to come down, you know, he, he admitted that he had foreknowledge in that Sense. I get the impression yes. from him that he was not he was not deeply involved and didn't had didn't have deep knowledge of, of the operation itself. He just was told, you know, get the heck out of the way and then shut up, you know, or then play along or whatever. That's the impression I get. But there is another guy uh, very closely associated with Giuliani named Bernard Carrick, who was the New York City police commissioner on 9/11 and also considered a hero of the day. And Carrick, uh, he just looks the part of a, of a mobster. Um, he was Giuliani's chauffeur in 1993. Uh, but in the 70s, he, and, and, and later he was um, an employee of the Saudi royal family, as well as an employee of, again, Morrison Knudsen in Saudi Arabia. So, um, and he, you know, he's just this thug. He ended up later becoming a chauffeur for Giuliani, then the Department of Corrections uh, um, officer, and then the, the police commissioner of New York City. His police department provided that passport that magically fell by the wayside at, at that the South Tower and was picked up and provided evidence for who the culprits were. Um, but, you know, we really ought to be serious because Bernard Carrick is in jail right now. And you know, he, he was accused of so many crimes, it's just ridiculous. And he was ultimately <laughs> thrown away. He's in jail right now. And so this guy who was um, clearly a mobster, clearly a, tied to Saudi Arabia, um, you know, one of the most interesting things about Carrick is on the day of 9-11, and we're talking about very early, uh, George Pataki, the governor, and Giuliani, and Carrick show up on national television, and, and one of the first questions Giuliani gets from the press is, a lot of people are talking about secondary explosives. Were there explosions that helped bring down the World Trade Center buildings? And, and Giuliani looks around like stunned, you know, and he looks back to Carrick for the answer. Bernard, 
I'm not kidding. And Bernard Kirk shakes his head no, there were no explosives. So that's when we got the first official answer that there were no explosives used on 9-11 from Bernard Kirk, who is now in jail. And uh, I think we ought to maybe take a second look at that official explanation. Uh, I think maybe some people. I think maybe some people at NIST may end up uh, in jail alongside Carrick. So they've continued to say that no explosives were used. Um, you did a marvelous article called "The Top Ten Connection- Connections Between NIST and Nanothermites." I, would you? Would you? Uh, I consider this to be related here to to your. Uh, well, it's the sort of bridges between your scientific and your your deep your deep uh, penetration of this underworld. Um, but talk about um, NIST's connections to nanothermites, which they deny were used, and they never even investigated. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, top ten connections between NIST and nanothermite is the paper. That's at the Journal of 9-11 Studies, and it's been a couple of years. But I, I published that because I just really wondered how NIST could play dumb so well. How could they uh, not think about uh, nanothermite at all? Because uh, they seem to have a lot of very um, well-qualified people who should have thought of that right away. And... Uh, some of their, uh, some of the people involved, for example, are the directors of NIST at the time. In October of 2001, Bush nominated a guy named Arden Beamant, who was, who was a materials science engineer. I mean, he's he's the kind of guy that would know uh, high tech materials better than anybody. He had just come from Purdue University. Purdue had a thriving nanothermite program under a professor by the name of Stephen Sun, who came from Los Alamos National Laboratories. So Beamant uh, really should have known. He had uh, several other interesting connections, but then he was replaced by a guy named uh, Harach Samergian. Um, and Samergian um, not only had the background, uh, but he wrote 10 papers with the world's leading expert on nanothermites, a guy named Mac- Michael Zachariah. Michael Zachariah has written more on nanothermites than anyone, I think. And, and uh, he worked at the University of Minnesota for a while. Uh, prior to that, he worked at NIST. Um, as well. So Michael Zachariah worked at NIST, but yet NIST can't figure out uh, the, the possibilities of nanothermite. You know, whenever they were thermite was brought up to them over the years, they'd always say, oh, gee, that didn't make, wouldn't make any sense. We'd have to have a million pounds of thermite, which obviously is not, <laughs> obviously is not true. If anybody's seen the new video by um, my friend John Cole, who's also a board member at Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, he's got a video called The Great Thermite Debate, and you can find it on 9-11 Blogger, and he shows that... Um, all these people who said you need all these gazillion pounds of thermite are crazy, and that you know people who said thermite can't bring down, can't cut steel columns are crazy because, you know, he did it up in his backyard. So obviously uh, it can be done, and it can be done very efficiently. But Harash Samergian wrote this paper, then these ten papers with this world's leading expert on nanothermite. Then we go into the company that provided the, the largest contingent of non-government employees. This is a really interesting company. It's called Science Applications International Corporation, or SAIC. And SAIC, um, as I said, provided all these people to the NIST investigation. They're all listed. This huge group of people are listed in the report as being authors of the report, essentially. But SAIC has this long history at the World Trade Center. In 1986, they did an evaluation of threats to the World Trade Center, and they and they proposed that a big bomb in the basement, just exactly like the one that happened seven years later in 1993, would do a lot of damage, right? So they provided this this scenario. And in 1993, when it did happen... It was SAIC that provided the official explanation for what happened. And then, and then in 2001, they're hired uh, after 2001 to help NIST write this report on what happened on 9-11. But SAIC, they make nanothermites. They're a huge corporation, but they have a subsidiary, a subsidiary cor- called Applied Ordnance Technology that, that not only makes nanothermites, they, they specialize in laser ignition of nanothermites. And they also are involved in projects where they like dole out money for research on nanothermite. So, but SAIC is just really interesting because it's this intelligence contractor for them. That's what they're known for for the most part. They even spy on the CIA. The CIA hires SAIC to spy on their employees. It's a little bit crazy. SAIC provided evidence um, to kind of prove that Iraq needed to be invaded. The evidence against Saddam. They provided yeah. the evidence. They provided the evidence, intelligence evidence for the capture of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. They trained the Saudi Navy. <laughs> they have employees like Robert Gates, who's our current uh, defense secretary. They did. Uh, Jerome Hauer, who was the OEM director at the World Trade Center. John Deutsch was the CIA director, and so on and so on. Um, so they're in they're, there. They're basically the yeah, CIA. That's who, that's who they are. And they're in there as the uh, as the biggest um, outside component in NIST, while NIST is doing its reports on the towers and. And That's on right. WTC7 as well? That's right. 
Yeah, and, and so it, you know, it's crazy that uh, that all, they could do, be so connected to the world tra- history of the World Trade Center and everything that happened to it, and the, the, all the evidence for what's happened over the last ten years, and have all these CIA directors working for them, and 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 so forth, and and not, and people just say, oh, that's all right, no problem at all. SAIC gave us the official explanation for what happened to the World Trade Center.